go ahead and get started. My name is John Mann. I'm a postdoc fellow at the North Central Regional Center for Rural Development. And I want to welcome everybody to today's webinar, uh, Working with Distilled Spirits. Before we get started, I want to point out a few items with uh, Adobe Connect um, and also with the uh, webinar. So first, um, you can see the poll to the right of the screen. And if you haven't already done so, uh, please take a moment and uh, uh, fill that out. You can check multiple boxes if you like. And I want to apologize for item number three. It's a, actually a relic from the previous webinar that I didn't catch. Um, two, um, part, of way, part of the way through uh, Dr. Berglund's presentation, we're going to have about a 60 second break. And we're going to ask you uh, a couple of questions. They'll be just for fun. And then at the conclusion of the presentation, after we do the question and answer session, We'll have a, a four. We'll have a quick uh, four-question poll, and I hope you will stick around for that. Um, and then next, we're going to change the screen just a couple of times during this presentation. I'm going to demonstrate real quickly. And so you'll have a flash, and it'll take just a moment for the screen to set back up. Um, if you'll notice, also towards the top of your screen, kind of off to the left, just a little bit, you'll see. A, a person that looks like they're holding their hand up. So if you click on the arrow next to that and you scroll down, you'll see the applause. And so at the uh, conclusion of the uh, presentation, after we get done with the question and answer session, let's uh, let's all please give uh, Dr. Berglund a warm round of applause, the Adobe Connect style. Change the screens one more time. The uh, last feature, and some of you are, have already figured this out, is the uh, how we're going to manage questions. And so if you'll notice, uh, at the bottom of the screen, there's a uh, chat box. And so right on the line above the word everyone, um, as we go through this presentation, if you will enter your questions, um, we will do our best to answer all of your questions at the conclusion of the presentation. And with that, I would like to uh, thank you again, uh, everyone, for your participation. And now Dr. Berglund's going. Uh, he's a, a distinguished professor of chemical engineering at Michigan State University. And he is going to tell us more about his experience working with distilled spirits. Dr. Berglund, it's all yours. OK, thank you very much, John. <clears throat> I'm, I got a little bit of a cold, so I hope everybody can hear me all right. <clears throat> My uh, throat's a little bit raw. Um, what I wanted to talk to you guys today about uh, was some work that I've been involved with for quite some time. Uh, and I'd like to begin by just giving you a brief introduction to how it is we came to be involved in this industry. The state of Michigan changed their laws about 15 years ago, which allowed small-scale artisan distillers to enter the business. Up until that time, we didn't have any small-scale distillers in the entire state. And so when that law change took effect, uh, Michigan uh, State University, the Michigan Department of Agriculture, the Apple Committee, uh, the Cherries, a whole bunch of different commodity groups and wineries all got together to see if there was a reason to have a uh, dedicated academic program related to distilled spirits in Michigan State. And the, the, the conclusion was, yes, that would be a, a very positive thing for the Michigan industry. So with that um, beginning that's that's how we got we came to be involved in this business and as you see you'll find out that we're pretty deeply involved in how this whole industry works and I'll try to point this out as we go along uh, the first thing is our program at Michigan State uh, is also uh, done in conjunction with Lulio University of Technology in Sweden where I also hold a, a faculty post uh, and what we're what we've done here is to establish uh, a program that's really dedicated toward the distillation business. Uh, there are a number of academic programs around the United States in brewing and winemaking, but our, our real forte and our focus is in the distilled spirits business. Having said that, uh, one of the things that we'll all come to realize as we go through these things is that the distilled spirits business is an extremely highly regulated industry. It's much more regulated than the wine and the beer industries. Uh, and there's a, another reason why we, we got involved uh, at a fairly early stage. 
in order to produce any distilled spirits in the United States, you have to have both a federal and state license. So that means there is no home exclusion for home distilling. It doesn't exist, although you might see it on the uh, Discovery Channel sometimes. Uh, you have to have a license to make even a thimble full of distilled spirits, which makes it quite difficult, different from, uh, from both beer and wine. Uh, another difficulty with that is that um, in the case of distilled spirits, in order to get the federal license, you already have to have constructed a distillery. So that there is a uh, there's sort of a catch-22 thing here where you have to have a distillery in order to get the license, but in order to distill anything, you have to have the license. So what we do a lot of work on at Michigan State in cooperation with our commercial partners is helping people enter this industry and do prototyping and uh, help people get trained because it's very difficult to enter the you cannot self train yourself unless you have a license so uh, we have several contributors to our activities at Michigan State Uncle John's Fruit House Winery uh, does business under the uh, title of uh, Red Cedar Spirits they have a complete distilled spirits plant license uh, and have a lease with MSU where MSU's equipment is actually used to operate that commercial facility in a, in, in a, a cohabitant, I guess, of our facility is another company called Working Bugs, who primarily focuses on industrial alcohol production. But as in the case of beverage alcohol, you have to have a license for that too. So both these two companies have full uh, distilled spirit plant licenses. Uh, we've, we've had a lot of support over the years from the Ag Bio Research, which is the new name of the Michigan Agricultural Experiment Station at MSU. Uh, we have some industrial collaborators, uh, Carl GmbH in Germany and Brewing Distilling Technologies in, in Pennsylvania and Philadelphia. And the state of Michigan has also been uh, quite active. Our facility in East Lansing is actually the largest distillation facility in the state of Michigan for beverage production. Uh, and uh, we have, a, I'll show you a picture of all the stills, but we have a 450 liter Christian Carl still, which is the type the German farmers use. We have a 450 liter still which we use for uh, for stripping purposes and also for a production of botanicals like gin uh, we can also make whiskey on that as well we have an 800 liter uh, 38 tray um, column for in order to produce vodka uh, and then we have a lot of other different things we have two up, we have a 230 and 400 liter fermenters we have access to fermenters up to uh, 16,000 liters for production and then we have a full comprehensive analytical lab that goes with that uh, we recently, Working Bugs, installed a continuous stripping column, and I'll show you a picture of that in a second. And also we have a mashing vessel that we use. So here's a photo. Uh, on the left-hand side is the small German uh, farmer still, the 150-liter one. Uh, all German farmers are allowed by law to have a still like this uh, and make up to 150 liters of spirits per year. Uh, and that's the size that it's fit at. And uh, there's, a, there's kind of a funny story that goes with that. In Germany, you're allowed another 50 liters per year for every stove you have in the house, so every, and up to three. So every German farmhouse has three stoves so that they go up to 300 liters. Uh, the middle still is the 450 uh, botanical and, and the whiskey still. And then you can see the pot on the side, uh, to the right-hand side, and the two columns. Those are 30-foot columns. Uh, put this in perspective, this is a 21 foot ceiling so we had to add 10 foot cupolas in order to accommodate the, the two columns as you see there. Uh, this is the uh, the stripping column I told you about. It too had to have a cupola constructed because it's 29 feet uh, in order to get it in and this will process uh, its 17 trays and can process up to uh, 500 gallons per hour. And this is the mashing vessel. It uses direct steam injection in order to mash grains and to convert the starch into sugars. Uh, we can also use this as a fermenter as well. And then the last uh, slide of equipment, uh, these are 4,000 gallon fermenters and you can see uh, there's not much head space on these guys either. They pretty much fill up the building. And so uh, these are typically used. They have agitation. They can be sterilized. And so we use these for our fermentation work. Uh, we do a number of educational activities, not unlike what we're doing right now, but we also have a, a two-day workshop that we teach at various venues. Uh, usually at least three to four times in East Lansing, once a year at Las Vegas Distillery in Las Vegas, Nevada. Um, we also teach it at, uh, at Catskill Distilling in Bethel, New York, which is actually across the street from Woodstock. And then this year we're starting uh, a, a workshop in Yersu, Sweden, which is about two hours north of Stockholm. 
Um, we also have a book, uh, Artisan Distilling, which comes on a CD-ROM. We just give it away. We don't charge for it. And we have a website that, can, that you can refer to when you're trying to get a hold of us. All right, there's the, that's, the, that's the front of the book. Anyway, it's the service activities that we go through. Uh, we do a lot of troubleshooting for people because once they start production, it's not uncommon for them to get into problems. We do a lot of experimental work for people to help them develop their processes. And we also have uh, quite a lot of contract work we do. We have our own tasting room as well at the facility because under Michigan law, you're allowed to actually sell on premises things that you produce on premises. Uh, the research activities we have underway are, are looking at uh, development of quality indicators. Uh, in the spirits business, any compound that is not alcohol or water, all the flavor compounds are con called congeners. And so what we look at are all these other compounds and see how they contribute to the flavor. Uh, we also look at control of regulated compounds. Actually, methanol is one of them. And we look at all kinds of different uh, yeasts, and we do barrel aging studies as well. Okay, so like I said before, uh, this is a pretty heavily regulated industry, and, and, and in fact, we don't just have one set of laws we have to work with, but really are 51, because each state has a different set of laws. And so if you're contemplating entering this industry, the first thing you have to do is to figure out what kind of a state you belong to. There's two different kinds of states. There's uh, controlled states, and there's uncontrolled states. Uh, and in control states, there is some uh, overarching state agency that handles all the distribution and pricing for spirits. Uh, so it, it, does, it does affect how you do your distribution depending on whether you're in a controlled or uncontrolled state. At the federal level, uh, the big guys are, uh, is, the federal, uh, is the Alcohol and Tobacco Taxation and Trade Bureau. It's called the TTB now, and it's in the Department of Treasury. Uh, after 9-11, the alcohol, tobacco, and firearms people were transferred to the Department of Homeland Security. So the alcohol, tobacco, firearms, and explosives, actually is their first full title, belong to the ATF. The ATF is no longer the regulator of spirits. And I, I always like to point out to folks that the uh, uh, this is Treasury, and these guys are serious, and they're the ones that got Al Capone. It wasn't the FBI, so uh, they do with calculators what other people do in other ways. So, um, so uh, the, the the governing body of regulations is is Title 27 in the Federal Code of Regulations. It, it's a riveting read. Let me tell you, it's great to read this. It's you know, it just it's a page turner, um, and uh, if you look on the website. Uh, the TTV has a pretty good website telling you how to work your way through all these things. They, they also teach a course sometimes in Cincinnati, but I don't think they've taught it now for two or three years. So I'm not sure about that anymore, whether they've completely discontinued it or not. But the uh, Title 27 is, uh, is, uh, the, uh, uh, is listed here on this website, and you can find the whole thing. Uh, so... Yeah, uh, that's all free on the web, and it's easy to get to. And the, the TTB's website is actually pretty good in, in terms of being instructive. Uh, the TTB is moving most of their things uh, into a uh, um, more electronic submission than what they used to have. It used to be, you know, something straight out of, uh, uh, you know, uh, a Christmas carol or something. You'd expect to see people with visors and uh, garters or something, but uh, they've really moved... Um, uh, the uh, let's go back here. Somebody wants to look at the uh, the uh, the last PowerPoint slide there, uh, and so um, it's Title 27, and this is the current law. Uh, and and this uh, the one thing about the laws in in terms of spirits, they don't change. And most of these laws were constructed after Prohibition, and they really haven't changed much at all since then. So you might see some rather strange features to them. Uh, the other thing about spirits is that there's something called the standards of identity. And within these standards of identity, everything is defined. And uh, what you probably want to make sure you do if you're entering or contemplating entering this industry is I don't think it's ever really advisable to make something that's not on the list because the way this is, this is controlled by the federal government is that you have to submit an, a label for approval. And so if they don't see... Um, if they don't see it on the list anywhere, you have to then file some additional paperwork, and that just slows everything down. So 
Um, so this is the, the classes of spirits that people look at normally. And uh, so these are called the standards of identity. And those are all spelled out in, in detail in, in Title 27. Uh, if we look at the steps in production of distilled spirits, we have to have a we have to make some choices. Uh, we have raw material decisions. Are we going to make it a fruit-based product? Is it going to be a root crop like potatoes? Uh, the uh, uh, you know are we going to use a grain uh, and uh, all those different possibilities? And then that of course dictates uh, what kind of pretreatment we're going to use because. If it's a starch-based product, then we have to use something like the mashing vessel to break the starch down to sugar because yeast cannot ferment uh, un, uh, unhydrolyzed sugar, so they, they have to be made into simple sugars. I have a question here about digestees. Um, cordials and liqueurs are listed in the code, uh, and they would be in Title 27 too, but they typically are at lower, concent lower alcohol concentrations. There are some odd... Uh, examples of that like for example uh, what more, most people think of as uh, uh, southern comfort is not a whiskey it's in fact a uh, it's in fact a liqueur because it's only 78 percent alcohol 76 percent alcohol you have to be 80 percent I mean 76 proof you have to be 80 proof in order to uh, to have um, uh, it classified as a spirit and then the other part is the distillation part and then finally the, the last step is uh, um, is the aging of the system. So, and, and often uh, brown spirits are almost always aged uh, in oak. Uh, people have tried lots of different other woods, but typically oak is the is the most popular one because of the it is uh, it brings a class it brings a classic um, flavor that people are looking for. Okay, I think we're, we're going to take a break right there, John. Okay, sounds good. Let me uh, pop these questions up real quick. And these kind of get to um, a couple of important points with respect to the law. So if you'll, uh, let me move this one over here. If you'll take just a moment and let me open this up a little bit more. Oops. I think I just... Uh, Sorry about that with the questions. <laughs> Chris, it looks like you've done an awesome job uh, making that point. <laughs> maybe, you're, maybe you're just an easy grader and I offer easy questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He'll give everybody just another uh, about 20 seconds to uh, jump in and answer the question. Questions? Okay, well, it looks like we got, uh, got some good participation there. Let me uh, hide these and uh, thank you for that. And uh, Chris, go ahead. Okay, the, uh, the, the next thing I was just going to briefly talk a little bit about, and then we can wrap up, has to do with the different types of stills that we use. And, and what it is we're actually trying to accomplish in the distillation part of this, uh, it's, it's my opinion, uh, and you might have differing opinions on these things, but I do not think it's a good idea to try to build your own still. And uh, there are some tricky metallurgical elements of this, uh, because high-proof alcohol is actually extremely corrosive. Um, and so uh, I would I generally recommend people buy stills that are made by people that have a, a long experience in doing that. A second factor about why you might want to buy a still as opposed to build one is that um, alcohol is explosive. I mean this is a fairly dangerous material you're working with and so you want to make sure the heat transfer uh, sections are all uh, engineered the right way so you don't get yourself in any problems. So we typically tell people uh, not to build their own stills and and I so that's you know even though you see it on moonshiners I still don't think it's a good idea uh, what are we trying to do when we're distilling things is trying to concentrate the aromas and uh, flavors and uh, basically uh, we're trying to use this as a, re uh, a recovery process 
So uh, obviously alcohol is the important part. That's what we get taxed on. That's what uh, the main product is. But there's all the flavors and everything that go with that. Um, in the case of distillation, uh, basically what we're looking at is a, pro a process where we have uh, a, a liquid and a vapor in contact with each other. And when we bring them in contact with each other, we get what's called a vapor-liquid equilibrium. And so what we see in the vapor phase is partitioned um, away from what's in the liquid phase. And that's what we're really trying to do is improve, uh, improve the concentration and do recovery. Because all spirits have to be at a minimum of 40% alcohol or 80 proof. Uh, this, uh, the, the point is, is that uh, you cannot achieve those kind of concentrations in a fermentation. So you have to use distillation in order to do the concentration. Yeast just cannot ferment to those concentrations. The, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a couple other things about ethanol and water is that you normally would expect to see that uh, when you have a solution that the, the more volatile component, in this case uh, ethanol, should always be in the vapor phase at a higher concentration than it is in the liquid phase. Um, that's not exactly what happens in ethanol and water. It's not, a, it's not a, uh, considered an ideal solution. And basically you can't distill past about 96% alcohol by volume. So uh, that actually is one of the problems that we have in making fuel alcohol. It's because there's always this residual about... 5% water that has to be taken out by another technique. We don't do that when we're making spirits, though. We don't use a secondary technique like that because we're going to eventually, what we do is we distill it to high concentration and then we cut it back with water to the drinking strength. So if we're making vodka, for example, we have to distill vodka to 190 proof. That's the federal law. If we're making whiskey, we can't distill it past 160 proof. That's the federal law. So you have a lot of these different things you have to go back and forth with in terms of the concentrations. I have some, uh, a few pictures of, of some schematics of some stills. I already showed you some of our stills, but there's a lot of different types of stills. And uh, if I look at these, we all, they all have one thing in common, which they have differing degrees of rectification, we call it. And that's where we intentionally let some of the vapor condense and come back down into the, into the still again. And by doing that, we're able to get much higher concentrations than we normally would be. Uh, normally, we'd be able to get with just without any rectification. So uh, the type, these are different types of stills I have shown, and there's some red arrows on this slide where you see what happens when you have these um, these bells, or you know you see a lot of stills that have a, a large copper surface at the top. What is happening there is you're transferring some of the heat to the room, and then that's causing some of the vapor to condense down and run back down in the, into the into the pot. And by doing that, we get that's where we have uh, uh, this idea of rectification. Okay, so uh, here's another one. You can, uh, if we looked at, uh, I think the previous slide, yeah, the previous slide was direct uh, flame fired, and that's the cognac style. Uh, this style has like a, a boiler, it's like a Dutch oven, you know, uh, kind of thing where you have actually steam in the jacket. So it's a much, it's a much uh, milder um, kind of a process to use. Uh, here's another example, and this one is when we start putting trays in, and uh, this is a, a schematic, basically, of our small still that we showed there. In order to achieve these really, really high concentrations, like the ones we need for, for vodka, it requires a minimum of 20 trays. So it, it, these are large columns to get the vodka kind of proof. And then here's some just really big, uh, here's some really large columns, kind of like what we have, just some, some schematics of them. Uh, when we do most of the small scale, well, actually most of the uh, the finishing runs on distillation are done by what we call taking cuts. And so the first cut uh, comes off the still is called heads, and that has a lot of things like acid aldehyde in it, acetone, uh, a whole bunch of things. And typically the heads are discarded or using a um, are used for other purposes. For example, we have a we use them a lot for sanitation around the distillery because it's really good for killing uh, bacteria. So you just put in a spray bottle and use it for, for sanitation. The hearts cut is the actual product cut, and that's where, you, that's where all the good stuff is. And then the tails is where we have this more dilute product that actually has what we refer to as fusel alcohols, which are these larger, longer chain alcohols that you used to make. And those are the ones that... Uh, um, have additional flavor components to them, but too much of them uh, is it ends up being a negative, um, give negative uh, uh, attributes.
So if we're looking at hearts, heads, and tails, and we just did a brandy still like I showed you a few minutes ago, uh, the, the heads cut would be somewhere like 80% alcohol by volume or, or better, even on one of these little three tray stills. Uh, the hearts cut maybe around 70, and then tails would be around 30. So uh, this is just gives you a little bit of an example about how this works. Uh, the, the classic cognac type still looks like this. It has a direct flame fire, and the concentrations, um, I mean, the, the temperatures that are reached are extremely high. It could be 700 degrees centigrade, for example. And when you do that, what you're, what you're accomplishing is you're actually doing a, a type of reactive uh, distillation, and reactive distillation actually makes new compounds. Uh, you have a copper surface at high temperature with organic molecules there, and so you're going to do some chemistry, <laughs> and you do. So that's, a, that's one of the ways, the, the type of differences in distillation styles that you might see, whether you use direct flames or whether you use indirect heating, and those are some of the important consequences of how these things are done. Uh, this is a, class, a, a schematic of a classic uh, Scotch whiskey setup, and in Scotch whiskey they use a two-stage uh, two system, so there's two stills. You distill it once in what they call a stripping or, or wash still, and then you do a spirit still. So you, after the first distillation, it may be at 30% alcohol or so, and then you redistill it to get up to the 50 or 60 that you want to get. So this is a very classic two-step process. Um, here's a little bit closer. What you notice about the, the Scotch whiskey stills is they use a steam coil. So they kind of are a, a combination of a mixture of the two, whether there's, it's not direct flame, but it's also not a, uh, it doesn't have a steam jacket. It has actually a coil. So um, the other thing you can see when you think about this a second is that Scotch whiskey has to be done, and, and just as in the same with cognac, both the Scotch whiskey is done from a, a beer and um, the cognac is done from wine. Uh, the German stills allow you to put slurries in there. So if you're doing a Scotch whiskey type thing, you have to remove the grain. And if you're doing a cognac style, you have to remove the, the, the grapes from the, from the mash. So there's differences that show up in these different types of still design. Uh, here's a bunch of different pictures of all the kind of classic uh, shapes they have in Scotch whiskey. Uh, this is a different style of still. It's, it's, it's also from France. It's called an Armagnac skill. Armagnac is a different type of, uh, of grape brandy, and it's made in a different region from cognac, and there's an Armagnac region uh, in, in France, and this is a column type still. So it's sort of a mixture between the French and the German styles a little bit. And then here's a, a, an old historical one that's called the coffee still, and it's not coffee like drinking coffee, it's, uh, it's the guy's name was coffee. Uh, and, and this particular still has a column, and it's one of the first column stills uh, that you would have seen in, 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 in use. And then we have the, the types of stills we use for bourbon, and uh, these are kind of funny because they have this thing, if you look at it closely, there's something called a doubler or a thumper, you know, there's different kind of ways to talk to this thing. Uh, and so they have extra things, and this is what you'd probably see more in the, uh, in the traditional side of uh, of, of a Kentucky bourbon type production. Um, if we're making large scale production of vodka, they use multiple columns. It actually takes five columns to go to extremely uh, large, uh, large volumes. And so uh, this is the typical kind of setup you would see, and, and it just shows you how things go back and forth and in and out. So basically, what you do uh, is you're replacing. What you normally would do in a batch system, you, you separate things by time coming off the still. And if you go to continuous systems like this, you actually pull off products at different parts of the other stills. And so you, you replace space with time. That's the basic idea. Then the, the old traditional uh, rum uh, type production actually had, uh, they even had some wooden uh, containers that they used. And so here's a typical two-step uh, double distillation of rum that would come from the Caribbean. Uh, rum has to be made from uh, molasses or it could be, it has to be sugarcane molasses or it has to be uh, sugarcane juice. You can't use beet sugar molasses to make, um, in order to make uh, rum. It's not allowed under federal law. Uh, it's almost impossible to do anyway because when, when sugar beets are treated, they're typically they use a lot of sulfur dioxide to stop any microbial growth, and that sulfur dioxide actually ends up in the final spirit and, and basically makes it uh, 
not worth something you'd want to drink. So beet sugar molasses is, is not used for rum production. And a lot of people ask me that over the years, and it's, it's just not done. Um, and uh, it, it, it doesn't make a good product, and it wouldn't be called rum anyway by federal code. So with that, I, I have some contact information that you can, uh, if you want to have follow-up uh, um, follow questions after you, you know, get off and want to send me some uh, emails and things, uh, I'd be happy to try to do that. So I think I just stop there and give my acknowledgments here of my collaborators and my institutions and, and try to see if I can answer any questions. Awesome, Chris. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm going to sit here and try to prep the questions. Um, while, we, uh, while I'm uh, asking my question, please take a moment if you've got a question and type it in. And We've got several in there. Um, Chris, for you real quick, um, just based on your, your most recent experience, is there a, a particular uh, distilled spirit that's gotten really popular today that a lot of people ask you about? Well, uh, probably the one that occupies most of the, the store shelf now are, are these flavored vodkas, and they've just exploded. There's so many different flavors of them, um, and they seem to be moving, but I think the, the real direction of the industry is actually into brown spirits, uh, and I think you're going to see a lot of whiskeys coming out in the next three to five years. Whiskeys have to be aged a minimum of two years uh, in oak for them to be called whiskey in the United States. So... Uh, uh, yeah, I think we're going to be seeing a lot of whiskeys, uh, and uh, right now vodka seems to be, you know, one of the big ones uh, as far as um, just having sheer volume, and sheer numbers. It's the number one spirit in the world as far as volume. Okay, I think I got to the to the first question that we haven't addressed yet, and it's by uh, Larry, um, and it's the wood. Uh, um, I'm not sure how to pronounce this correctly, but it's uh, Aquavit uh, in class Maybe. one. Aquavit is Aquavit. a flavored vodka. Yeah, Aquavit, you use uh, caraway mostly. For, and, and that's a very traditional Scandinavian drink, actually. Uh, and uh, it, the, the, the main flavor is actually caraway. Uh, but it has, like most flavored vodkas, it could have all kinds of different uh, compounds. They may use some dill, they may use caraway, they may use cumin. There could be a whole bunch of different herbs or botanicals that are used to make it. But it's typically has a kind of a characteristic caraway flavor and it's usually got a little bit of color to it. It's usually a bit of an amber color. Okay, um, I want to, audience, I'm going to do something real quick. Um, I'm going to adjust this chat box so I can see these questions just a little more clearly. So bear with me for just a moment and hopefully make us more efficient um, in uh, seeing and addressing the questions. So. Um, forgive the uh, forgive the disruption. Okay. Um, all right. The next question. Robert's asking a question about where can you get a you get a CD ROM, and I'm not clear what CD ROM uh, you may be referencing. Um, so if you'll clarify that question. Uh, if, oh, go ahead. If he's, if he's asking about the book, we can send that to them. Uh, okay. By um, and we've had a couple of questions about this particular presentation available after the presentation. And if you will send me an email, I've got my email posted in there a couple of places, and we'll also show it to you at the end of the presentation. I'll be happy to send you a link uh, with this webinar, and it will have uh, all of Chris's information, uh, contact information as well. And you can also uh, feel free to share that, uh, share this link with anybody uh, that you that you want. Um, okay, there's another, the next question down. It says, uh, somebody's asking, Ramel is asking a question about um, Hogue Stills, uh, positive or negative? There's a little bit of feedback, but Chris, what's your, your take on that? Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, I, I kind of try not to. <laughs> I try not to pick and choose sure. too much. But, uh, yeah, so uh, we, uh, we only use Carl Stills from Germany, so I'll just leave that at that. So that's what we chose to do. So. Okay. Um, and this is uh, another question from the same person. Uh, cane juice. Um, isn't that, uh, I don't even know how to pronounce this. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. yeah. To make cachaca, you can only use cane juice. But when they, when they make differing grades of rum, if you want to go to a lighter rum, it's not uncommon to mix cane juice in with the molasses to make a lighter rum. But the Brazilian drink cachaça is made from cane juice. That's correct. And they just recently got basically an appellation is what it comes down to 
The only place in the world you can make cachaça now is Brazil. Just like the only place you can make cognac is cognac in France. So the Brazilians were able to uh, have been able to protect that that brand. Okay, um, Nikki has got a question about using organic beets. Have you got uh, got any feedback or experience with that? You mean organic sugar beets? Uh, I'm gonna guess yes. Okay. Uh, well, we've done a lot of work with organic products, uh, not beets themselves, mostly just because the sugar beets don't have an appellation. I mean, don't have a standard of identity. So if you make something out of sugar beets, you have to come up with a name for it and then convince the federal government uh, of that. And so there's no reason why you can't technically use sugar beets. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of sugar in them. You need sugar to ferment. Sure, it, it, there's no reason why you can't. The difficulty from a practical standpoint comes up with this whole idea about what do you call it. And, uh, and, and so that's not an insurmountable problem. Uh, I know a guy, the guys at Las Vegas Distillery actually have gotten the name of a product that's called Rumsky. And so that's about half rum and about half whiskey. And the feds actually let them call it that. So if you're, if you're persistent enough, you might be able to get a name for something like that. But we've worked with organic uh, materials a lot. Uh, one of the things that we found mostly in grains is that uh, grains tend to be heirloom type grains and they have more starch than a lot of the standard type commercial grains. And so sometimes their yields are higher. Interesting. Um, so a person named uh, Testing Connection uh, is curious about when the Las Vegas workshop, you mentioned doing a workshop in Vegas. It'll be late summer, early fall. We haven't okay. got it scheduled yet. Is there, a, is there a place folks can go to get that information or would you just say uh, send me an email? We'll have it posted on our website when it's uh, the artisandistilling.org. We'll post the date on there and there, there will be a, a link on how to register for the class on there too. Okay. Um, Mark has got a question about sulfides. He asks, when do sulfides come out during a distillation run? Well, um, you, you hope they don't come out at all because you're hoping that the sulfides react with the copper and are, and are actually contained with the still. And that's one of the, <clears throat> that's one of the reasons why we use copper is because it does react with sulfur. Uh, and so if it's a sulfided wine, though, it's a problem because it comes out almost the whole almost the whole run. And so we never recommend, you know, recommend using sulfided wines because uh, that's really a problem and that sulfide ends up in the product. So if you're going to make something from wine, typically you do not sulfide it or extremely low levels of sulfide. But I would expect most of it, if it's going to come out, it usually comes out fairly early uh, in, in the highest concentrations and then it tails off during the rest of the run. But it kind of comes out through the whole thing with the high concentration up front. Um, Chris, regarding your workshop, have you considered uh, uh, putting this on a DVD or maybe even an online version of the class? Uh, no. Uh, we, when we, yeah, the, sim the simple answer is no, because most of the activities that we have around these workshops and classes we teach are the actual hands-on part of it. So we run the stills, people smell things, they taste things, they understand what's going on, and that that part of the experience uh, would would not be possible online. Now, having said that, uh, some of my colleagues at Harriet Watt University in Scotland do have some form of an online course, and so uh, you, you might look into that if you're looking for something online. Uh, but our but typically we don't uh, we don't have any online things because a, a major part of what we're trying to do is the hands-on part. Sure. That makes a lot of sense. Um, a question from Jerry. Uh, what are the most com common stumbling blocks for people just getting started with uh, artisan distilling? Uh, I would say the, the most important thing uh, and then place where people might have the, the biggest difficulty will be in creating a good marketing plan so they can sell their product. That I can't emphasize that enough. Uh, it's not like a field of dreams. If you build it, they may not come. <laughs> so you really have to have a really, a, a really good uh, plan. When, we're t when people are starting out, we often refer to this as the story. What story are you going to tell about your product? What's going to make your product different, either from a raw material standpoint, a, a place, location, 
some sort of sense of space that makes your product different than other people's and, and that you can actually sell it. So I would always uh, recommend that anyone entering this uh, would give a lot of thought to the marketing side of it. Uh, the next question, I think you, you touched on part of it, um, but it's from John, and he asks, um, uh, what he's got 26 acres of tillable farmland in Michigan, and he wants to know what he can grow that will make the uh, that can be distilled that will make the effort worth it. Well, um, it can pretty much grow about anything, I suppose, because in, 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 uh, as far as uh, uh, I would I would recommend. Uh, probably some sort of interesting grain is probably because grains get the highest yields uh, from anything and uh, you might be able to get some heirloom grains or you might be able to have some, some uh, distinctive uh, um, sort of a, a grain that uh, other people don't have so that's probably the direction I would look uh, in order to try to make things a little bit more unique. Okay, a question from Edward. Um, he is a honey producer, and uh, he's been approached by distillers uh, in using honey for vodka. Is this a new thing, or has it been done over the years? Uh, there, there are people that make uh, vodka from honey, and these guys in New York State, uh, um, it's I think Montezuma, I believe it's the one, uh, they, they do make a honey vodka. We've also seen people that make a, a honey flavored vodka and that's actually probably a better route because honey is actually a pretty expensive raw material to try to make a spirit out of and so it's probably uh, you know it's it's better used as a flavoring agent than as a base material but there are people that have done it and, and that's uh, you know so they're, 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 they do exist. I mean Drambui is the classic um, example of a honey product where uh, Scottish whiskey is flavored with honey and some spices. So um, certainly there's some old brands that use honey like John Bowie. A question from Tom. Um, he uh, says, with so many products being uh, done and complex chemistry, is there a potential for, uh, I believe, unhealthy products showing up? Could you say that again? I didn't quite catch um, all that. Sure. He, he asks, uh, basically, a lot of new products uh, being introduced, and, and there's a lot of complex chemistry uh, involved with that process. Um, is there a potential for unhealthy products showing up? Uh, not, not a real high potential, because most of the things that are really unhealthy, you wouldn't want to drink anyway. I mean, uh, there's so, so if something's actually as, a, as spoiling orga organisms or something like that, it's an inferior product. So I would say uh, that doesn't have, uh, of all these things, that's not a very high probability that you're going to have that. Uh, and it's because the way in which you do all these things, it takes significant care to get a, a potable product. So I don't think that's a particularly big risk. Uh, Chris, scrolling down through the questions, somebody's looking for your contact information again. So I went ahead and backed this slide up just a bit. Um, um, so Andy's question, uh, what is your opinion of smoked whiskeys? Um, can you talk about that just, just briefly? Well, uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. I mean, you can smoke the barley that you're going to make, or smoke the grain that you're going to make the whiskey out of, and so that's the typical way of doing it. I suppose you could also um, add smoky flavor in other ways, but uh, smoke is certainly... Um, it is certainly one of the flavoring agents that people use and uh, you know I like to tell everybody you know this is there's a reason why Baskin Robbins has 31 flavors of ice cream I mean there's there's a, everyone has different tastes and, and and so that's the advantage of having a wide range of flavoring agents at your disposal so I, I think that the there are differing levels of smokiness that people are trying to impart and some of them are actually to smoke the grain prior to distillation, prior to fermentation, and some are actually adding smoky flavors afterwards. Okay, um, here's a good question uh, regarding the laws. Uh, oop, just lost it. Let me back up. It says, uh, can you explain the permit application process and the taxation process, both at the federal and state level? Um, you know, basically, uh, which one do you need to do first, and and who do you pay? So, could you talk a little bit about your experience in, in Michigan with that? Yeah, we uh, yeah. If you name, you name a mistake, we probably made it. Uh, the uh, um, 
basically, uh, it depends on what state you're in, for one thing. Uh, that's a big deal. Uh, the, uh, the federal license generally can be pursued without the state license in hand. Uh, and so most people start the two processes simultaneously. Uh, and it depends on what jurisdiction you're in, whether that's necessary or not. Um, and so some states might require you to have the federal license first. Here in Michigan, they wouldn't issue your state license until you showed them the federal license, but they'd go ahead and process the application. Uh, now, at the federal level, there isn't any, there isn't any uh, fee for applying for a federal license. The only thing you really, the, the main cost is actually your bond, because they want you to bond to make sure your taxes get paid. So, um, so that's the main cost at the federal level. Here in Michigan, at the state level, the, the permitting process is, the, the actual fee is not very much. Uh, and so it's not so much the cost of doing these things, it's more a matter of getting all the paperwork done. Uh, so, and, and at the federal level, uh, you have a monthly report. I just did ours last week, so it's kind of painfully fresh in my memory, uh, that uh, you have to fill out a monthly report on all your spirits. And, uh, uh, and that, in that report, you tell the federal government which of those spirits have been taken out of bond. If you have things in bond, you don't have to pay the taxes on it. If you have, if you, when you take it out of bond, that's when you pay your federal excise tax. And the federal excise tax is $13.50 per proof gallon. And a proof gallon is 50% alcohol. So on a 100% on a alcohol gallon basis, it's $27 a gallon. Uh, that's about what it comes down to. And so uh, that $27 basically is what it costs per case of fifths. If I have 12 fifths of, of any spirit, I basically have around uh, two proof gallons or around $27 federal excise tax on that case, per case. And depending on what state you're in, uh, there's, been a, there's a state tax then too on top of that. And so some states do an excise tax. Some states like Michigan, we have a markup, and our markup is nearly 100% at retail. So whatever you sell it to the state at, you just double the price when it goes to the shelf. Wow. Um, from Larry, uh, he asks, um, are the bottoms considered hazardous waste? Um, the tails? Yeah, uh, you would have to ha take some care in disposing of them, uh, depending on what the concentration is. I mean, uh, we, we normally redistill tails, and we have some other uses for tails that we've come up with, so we don't have to uh, dispose of them, but uh, there are, you know, EPA limits of how much, uh, how, how many of these alcohol, how much of this alcohol can be uh, sent out of the plant. So you have to watch that. Uh, from Rich, I mean, it's, an, oh, go ahead. it's an EPA issue. Yeah. Okay. Um, from Richard, he's asking, uh, do you see any benefit uh, to chilled filtering versus non-chilled chilled filtering? It depends. It depends on what you're trying to filter. I mean, uh, if it's it, it, it has a lot to do with what your you know what the goal of the filtration is. Whether you know which compounds you're trying to get out. Uh, a lot of people cold shock and cold filter their products. That's very common, and that has a tendency to to bring out a lot of uh, oily kind of materials and get them to come out. Uh, it it like I say, it really depends on what the what the impurity is you're trying to remove. Uh, and so, uh, but I would say that a lot of people do chill, chill or cold filter products, and that has a tendency of taking out these more uh, oily kind of compounds. Uh, related to that question, uh, Jerry asks about uh, charcoal filtering. Do you use that, and if so, how much? Oh, well, a typical kind of number is around, if you're going to charcoal filter vodka, let's say, I believe a kind of a starting point is usually around a gram per liter. Uh, one gram of charcoal per liter of, of the, the spirits. That's a kind of a starting point. It depends on what, I mean, there's, there's thousands of charcoals out there, so it depends a lot on what it is you're trying to take out. Uh, but, uh, yeah, charcoal filtration is, is used in vodka. We don't use it so much, uh, but a lot of people do. Um, when we make vodkas, we actually kind of like to leave a something in there that, so it does have a little flavor, and, and if you, when you carbon treat them, you have a tendency of taking everything out. And so they become very, very neutral. Uh, so 
Um, sometimes we intentionally don't carve and treat because we want to leave a little something in there. A little, as the Germans called it, it's a geist, a ghost was left <laughs> behind. And so, uh, um, so we sometimes intentionally do not. Uh, qu a question about your workshop, um, the one in East Lansing. Um, Chris, what is the price for that? How much does that, does that cost? The one here is $500 uh, for two days, um, and uh, we're already full for this next month, so uh, we'll have another one in June, I think. Okay. But we, try to lim we limit enrollment to 25 to 30 people so people can have a good experience. And uh, if any, if we get over 30, it's just not, it's not good for the, the, the people's experience and being able to do all the things we want them to do. Um, okay, a, a question from Christopher. Uh, let me see if I can get my chemistry right here. He's asking uh, if you can use um, hydrogen peroxide to deal with the uh, sulfur dioxide. The, sul the sulfur. You, yeah, yes, you, if, you, if you have sulfites and you want to get them out of there, you can oxidize it with with, with peroxide and then treat it with lime, I mean treat it with calcium and then you can get the calcium sulfate to come out. Um, so yeah, yeah, you can you can remediate wines with sulfites in them uh, to the point where you can actually use them. Uh, at some point you have to ask yourself what's the residual quality of that going to be when I, if you go to several steps and so uh, you might be able to get it to make it as a, a fortifying uh, spirit like if you wanted to make a liqueur or something but I think once you start doing those things I don't think you're going to have a fine spirit anymore I think it's going to be something you might use for something else uh, that, that gets heavily flavored but yes in fact that's exactly right you can treat with peroxide, foul peroxide by uh, with calcium addition and you'll get the calcium sulfate will come out um, a question from Robert. Uh, is there a rule of thumb for volume of usable spirits from a mash or from a wash mash? Um, his example, say you have 80% alcohol to start, the potential is, or I'm sorry, 8% alcohol to start, the potential is 8%, but what is a common volume for um, a heart's cut? Assume whiskey. Yeah, we the number we usually use is around 70% yield. That's something, uh, if you look at the total amount of alcohol you have in the system, we we reckon somewhere around the 70% range is what your final yield is going to be. That's, that's you know, that's a rule of thumb, right? It's like conventional wisdom. Sometimes it's neither, uh, but it, it's, a, it's a very round number. But I'd say somewhere in that range. Um, if you read a still tales, which is one, something you can do as well, um, you might bump that up slightly, but I would say for for planning purposes, I wouldn't assume much more than about a 70% recovery. Okay. Uh, Chris, is uh, he explains that he's uh, in, the, in pursuing the development of a CFD application to model two-phase uh, states um, within a still for the purpose of evaluating still design. Um, because uh, it looks like he's not aware of any current applications that tackle this. Are you aware of any CFD apps being used in, in that in, in this industry? Um, probably not so much in the beverage industry because these stills have a tendency of being smaller. Uh, but um, and and when they're smaller stills, there has a there's a tendency to have a lot of wall effects. Okay, uh, if you looked at if you go to more of the petrochemical industry, though, I'm certain that they, they do that um, in terms of uh, computational fluid dynamics. And, and so uh, uh, particularly in the case of packing materials, they do a lot of that there. Uh, we do model our stills, but we don't use the CFD type models. We actually use more things like Aspen or something like that that are uh, more, um, what do I want to say, more rudimentary type models. Um, there, there is a, there's a kind of a fundamental difficulty with trying to model these stills, though, and that is they're batch stills. And so uh, trying to uh, get the initial conditions right so that you can actually get the model to converge is not so easy. Um, uh, back to the uh, question regarding uh, charcoal filtered. Uh, does vodka need to be charcoal filtered?
In Canada, it's required. In the United States, it is not. Easy question. Um, okay, uh, Peter asks, uh, do you have to secure a bond with the uh, TTB? Yes. <laughs> and not only that, uh, when you get your TTB license, uh, you will also have to um, waive your right of due process. Uh, so uh, that's another thing about getting a license. They, they have march-in rights if they want to look at your books and things, and they don't have to have any due process to do that. They're, they're allowed to do it. Now, having said that, my, my uh, experience with the TTB is that they always will call you and make an appointment. I've never seen them. They must really, you'd have to be really doing something uh, uh, pretty bad for them to come in and do that. They'd have to really suspect that you really were uh, basically bootlegging. I mean, and so uh, under normal business practices, um, my experience has always been they made an appointment well in advance. So, uh, because they they, they want your books to be right, so they give you plenty of time to get everything squared away. So. Um, JD is asking a question whether or not we will uh, put together a more technical webinar on the steps from uh, raw material to finished product. Um, I think from my perspective, um, I'm, I'm actually an economist, and so Chris is the expert on this topic. I would defer you maybe to his classes. Um, but Chris, what do you think about a, a, a webinar with maybe a little bit more detail and maybe you know some uh, some uh, other technologies or something like that? Um, uh, I mean, I think we could consider that. Uh, we normally do that through our workshops sure. and the regular undergraduate courses we teach, and uh, uh, so we actually you know we teach a number of courses, and so um, we 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 normally achieve it that way. But I mean, I suppose there is the possibility of, of doing something a little different. That might, that might even uh, fit into a potential uh, online program or online course or something like that. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Um, okay, the next question. Uh, when a brand state uh, states um, that it is distilled five times, does that mean uh, that the spirit is recycled um, through their column still five times? No. What the, when someone says how many times something's been distilled, that's merely a fanciful term. The, the feds do not control that and they don't even evaluate it and so uh, it doesn't it could mean anything um, you know it's like uh, so it, it's really the the federal guys call, refer to it as fanciful it just it's just advertising it doesn't mean anything technically and it doesn't actually and some people make a big deal about it the implication people are trying to what they're trying to imply is that somehow the number of times you distill it somehow affects its purity but that, that doesn't really mean that because, for example, our, our column has 38 trays. We only distill it one time, but we can get to the highest purity you want to because the number of trays actually dictates how pure the material is. Uh, so uh, if somebody had no trays and distilled it five times, they wouldn't have anywhere close to what we'd have on one time. So uh, this is the problem. is it, it, it doesn't really have a meaning. And I, I, I know of people that really try to make a big deal about it, but yeah. Okay, um, we've got time for maybe one or two more questions at most. Um, so, real quick, John asks, uh, "How many bushels of grain does it does it take to make a gallon of spirit?" Grain is always about sixty percent starch. Uh, you should expect to see um, around this is a round number around two and a half gallons of alcohol for every bushel is kind of a round number, and that depends a lot on the the uh, I think that corn ethanol guys can get up to almost 2.8, but that's just it's that it's a two and a half to that range somewhere is kind of what you could expect to get. But then you still probably want to apply that 70% rule on top of that. So uh, keep that in mind. So, but for just the purpose of some general calculations, I'd say uh, start out with two and a half and apply 70%, and that's about what it ought to be because all grain is pretty close to around 60% starch. It's not that far off. Okay, um, I'm, I'm going to try to get to two more questions real quick before we uh, close this out. But uh, Chris, if you're willing, we'll stick around and we can uh, maybe answer a couple of these others as they come up. But it looks like Larry's got a follow-up real quick. I want to jump to that one. Um, and he asks, what do you mean by trays? Oh, okay, uh, if, you, uh, if you looked at the columns, the pictures of the columns, there's literally a, a metal tray inside of there that has perforations on the bottom and it has an overflow system. So what you're trying to do is you have reflux coming down the column as a liquid, 
it's trapped on the tray and then the vapor comes up through it. So by doing that, by having those additional trays, that allows you to get to much higher concentrations of alcohol. So if you had, it, it, you have to have these, they're, they're equilibrium contacts we call them. And basically another way to think about it, it's almost like you had a little pot still on each one of the trays because you're bringing it into equilibrium on each one. And, and that's a standard, a standard technology for accomplishing those. Okay. Um, but they're really not, they're, they're physical devices. I mean, they're, it's a physical flat piece of metal. So. Okay. So the the last question we're going to be able to get to is uh, from Jason. He asks, uh, um, "What creative use of of tells, or what creative uses of tells?" We have another business where we can convert those into flavor compounds. So uh, we actually collect them and. Uh, and we do some different chemistry on them, but it takes a lot of them. That's the problem. Okay. Um, well, everyone, we're going to conclude the question and answer session here. I'm going to jump to the next screen and to see. Uh, I'm hoping that you'll uh, stick around for just a moment and answer a couple of our uh, poll questions. They're related to uh, technology transfer. Um, also, with that, let's uh, let's give uh, Dr. Berglund a, a round of applause. So if you remember the uh, icon at the top. And uh, while folks are, are looking at these uh, poll questions, uh, Chris, I'm going to scroll through here and look for a couple more questions um, and see if uh, maybe there was one that we missed. I think there was one. Um, so JC asks, uh, what is the current status of the MSU stills and classes? They're all, they've all been moved to 2000 Merritt Road in East Lansing. It's the old public works building for the city of East Lansing. It's a 45,000 square foot facility. So everything's been relocated from Michigan Brewing Company. 